Welcome to the Sustainability Nugget Podcast. I am Rara Sue and Rara Ivy. And I'm Tosin Fodora Show. On this podcast, we learn about sustainability by discussing various related topics while focusing on three pillars, the economy, the society, and the environment. Hello guys, welcome back to another episode on the Sustainability Nugget Podcast. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Professor James Van Nostrom. He's the director of the Center for Energy and Sustainable Development and also a professor of law at the West Virginia University. On this episode, we'll be discussing the clean energy revolution in the United States, particularly its drivers and the political and cultural factors affecting the clean energy economy. Without further ado, let's jump right into today's episode. Professor James, thanks so much for being here on the Sustainability Nuggets podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So let's start off with you introducing yourself to the audience and telling us more about your role. Yes, I'm James Van Ostren. I'm a professor of law at the West Virginia University College of Law, and I also direct our Center for Energy and Sustainable Development. Yeah, so how did you get into this field? Like, of course, you just said you're a professor of law, but you're really also into clean energy. So how, like, what was the route? How did you get interested and involved in the clean energy space? I practiced energy law for, gee, over 30 years. Um, I graduated, once I, after I graduated law school, I, I took a job with the New York Public Service Commission in Albany and learned all about uh, regulating investor-owned utilities. And then I moved to Seattle, Washington, and for 22 years, I represented energy companies primarily in electric retail, electric and natural gas retail rate proceedings in front of all the PUCs around, I did cases in front of eight different PUCs. Then around 2008, I started transitioning into law school teaching. I got uh, my environmental law degree at LLM, which is a master's in law degree at Pace University in White Plains, and then directed an environmental NGO at Pace while I was there, the Pace Energy and Climate Center, just working on clean energy issues. And then in 2011, I took a job to come to West Virginia and, and get a, a tenured a tenure track position at WVU and then also direct, opened up the Center for Energy and Sustainable, Sustainable Development, which is where I've been for the last 11 years. Awesome. Talking about the clean energy revolution in the United States, what's really are the drivers of um, this revolution right now? I'd say for the past 10, 15 years, it's been really market forces in terms of those regions of the country that were heavily dependent upon coal have been um, hit disproportionately hard because there are just cheaper ways to generate electricity now. First, there was the natural gas. Once we just started developing fracking and horizontal drilling and the ability, ability to extract mass quantities of natural gas from shale. So we've, we've got just uh, natural gas prices came down, cheap and plentiful natural gas, um, technological advances in terms of combined combustion turbines that uh, combined side combustion turbine, which used to generate natural electricity from natural gas. So the prices really came down in terms of being able to generate electricity with natural gas. Then the last few years has been wind and solar. So lots of decarbonization has been happening in the energy sector just because um, natural gas, wind and solar are cheaper ways to generate electricity than, than coal. So it's been a lot of just technological advances. And then there's some pretty aggressive state energy policies. Until recently, we haven't done much at the national level, but there's a lot of states that have adopted very aggressive clean energy goals. We've got probably a dozen states now that have adopted zero net carbon standards by 2045 or 2050. So policies are being put in place in states to, to drive further decarbonization. And then more recently, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act enacted in, in August that provides some incentives at the federal level for decarbonization, you know, renewables, nuclear, hydrogen, um, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, so now we finally have some things going on at the federal level to sort of drive that additional decarbonization. Oh, awesome. So how would you, um, how would you say the clean energy economy in the United States is actually faring when compared to like other countries? I, th I don't think we're moving as rapidly as we need to. Um, we're doing better than some countries, not as good as other countries. You know, we had a four year hiatus when Donald Trump was president who didn't, you know, pulled us out of the Paris climate agreement and didn't really believe that climate change was an issue that needed to be addressed. So we took a little bit of a 
pause there. Now I think the United States is is pretty in, is fully engaged again, um, and I think you know we've we've done pretty well mostly through market forces. Like I say, it's been just technological advances that have made generating electricity with with wind and solar um, cheaper than using coal. Um, but now I think we need to take more aggressive actions to do our part in terms of achieve the necessary reduction in the greenhouse gases to keep, you know, temperatures at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And right now we're at 1.2. So it's getting, it's getting serious. So no, we're talking about the U.S., but like if we really want to know how we can go further, we need to look outside, right? So what country do you consider like the golden child, like the best in clean energy right now? And really, what do you think is making them so successful? Well, just there are a lot of countries in Europe, I think, that have got a pretty spectacular record and the Scandinavian countries in particular. And I guess among them, I would probably identify Sweden as being probably the, the, the most impressive in terms of decarbonization. They get about um, 75% of the electricity from non-carbon sources. So um, hydroelectric and, and they have a lot of nuclear plants. They also get... Um, about 16% from wind power. So they, they are a long way towards fully decarbonized and they're trying to have a net zero carbon economy by 2045. They're doing a lot of right things and correct things in terms of public policies. Like they put a price on carbon, um, carbon pricing at the harvest, highest carbon price in the world. And that sends a really strong signal to decarbonize. It makes, it makes um, renewables and nuclear more cost competitive. So it's a big, it's been a big driver. They also have pretty good use of, of combined heat and power, which is fueled by, by biofuels rather than we, we tend to fire carbon combined heat and power in the United States with natural gas, but Sweden actually uses biofuels. So combined heat and power is when you're actually generating electricity and then you're actually using the heat that's a byproduct of generating electricity for some other purpose, like heating and cooling buildings. And so they've they've got a lot of combined heat and power in, in Sweden as well. So that's that's probably the country I'd I'd point to. But there's other good examples in you know, the other Scandinavian countries, Norway and Denmark, and they're also pretty impressive in terms of clean energy policies. Awesome. So like we can see that some other countries, like you said, Sweden is really ahead, and this is because they're really implementing like setting policies and all. Uh, so we can say like maybe culture, cultural differences might be one of the reasons why other countries are not adopting as fast. So how do um, cultural factors actually in their um, different states and countries from adopting um, the right policies? Well, that's the issue that I, that's definitely a, a predominant one in West Virginia. And that's the one of the reasons I wrote the book that I just, that was just published by Cambridge University Press, The Coal Trap, which really does talk about um, West Virginia. And there are some other states, Wyoming comes to mind, um, Kentucky, Indiana. There are other states in the United States that have a long history of coal mining. Um, the Appalachian states in particular, I think they would take credit to, gee, we industrialized the United States on the backs of the Appalachian coal miners. And so it's a source of great pride. And for many decades, it was, a you know, it employed tens of thousands of people. And then we had, you know, mechanized mining and mountaintop removal. So the number of miners employed declined, but coal production remained high. But there's just, um, it's a great source of pride in West Virginia. And that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I called my book The Coal Trap, because it's been really hard because of those cultural connections to, to move away from coal. It's, it's almost seen as an, unpatriotic if you suggest, you know, burning less coal and using wind or solar or natural gas instead, then you're, you know, it's made it a challenge in terms of talking about a transition in West Virginia because people just don't want to let go of the, that coal legacy. At the beginning of the call, you, you talked about how um, it's now cheaper, like the cleaner energy. So them not wanting to go away from coal, I really, is it affecting like their economics like and the environmental status of the energy structure in those states? Yeah, it's been, it's been a a huge issue in terms of our regulators in West Virginia. The the West Virginia Public Service Commission is really not 
pushing the utilities towards the cheaper sources of electricity. I mean, I think my book really focuses on the years 2009 to 2019, which I refer to as the lost decade, because that's when the shale gas revolution really took off and really made coal relatively uneconomical as a means of general electricity. It's also when Obama became president, and so we had more attention focused on environmental issues. And so in West Virginia, a lot of the problems in the coal industry, rather than acknowledging their market forces, were blamed on Obama's job killing EPA. But at the the state level, we've also had the utilities continue to burn coal. They're continuing to be urged or even required by our regulators to continue to burn coal, even though natural gas has been cheaper for probably the last 12 years. And even though wind and solar is now cheaper, um, the regulators are actually putting pressure on the utilities to keep burning coal at historical levels. Um, and that's caused our electricity prices to go up pretty dramatically. The, the numbers I calculated for my book between 2008 and 2020, which roughly corresponds to the last decade, our electricity prices in West Virginia on average grew at an annual rate five times greater than the national average because most of the other states have figured it out. It's cheaper to generate electricity with natural gas, wind, or solar, and they've diversified the electricity supply. And there's a prominent role for energy efficiency. And in West Virginia, We've clung to coal. We are still 91% coal-fired as of the end of 2021, mm. 91%. Yeah. Um, and nationally, that figure has gone down from 48% in 2008 to less than 20% now. But we're 91% coal-fired, and we have electricity rates to, to show for it in terms of just massive rate increases um, that are imposed on our consumers. And we're a relatively poor state. We can't afford it, but the Public Service Commission seems to think they have their mission is to protect the coal industry rather than to protect ratepayers. So that's where we are. Yeah. So I think I'll play like devil's advocate or rather just ask a question. I, like you talking about this now reminded me of a podcast I listened to earlier in the year and it was about co-workers. It was like a documentary but on a podcast and um, it really captured some of the co-workers actually mm -hmm. losing their job and no option being given to them i know that like yeah it's more expensive clean energy is cheaper here yeah, but how do you protect the current workers from not losing their job like how do you give them an alternative even in this clean energy space because if you just put in um policies to cut down are you actually creating opportunities for these people whose career has just been like in this space how do you think we can actually go? What's the route we can take to make sure we're actually having a win-win situation and not just like, oh, saying we're going to a cleaner energy and not caring about families who, who like depend on that industry for their livelihood? That's a great question. And it's a, it's a big challenge because um, generally the the clean energy jobs do not pay as as well as as the coal mining jobs. I mean, the the kids in West Virginia they can they can go into a coal mine right out of high school and make about eighty five thousand dollars a year, and and right now we have fewer than twelve thousand coal miners in the state of West Virginia, down from maybe one hundred forty thousand a few years ago, in in the, in the middle of the of the twentieth century, and so that that challenge is referred to as a just transition, making sure that no one gets left behind. And it's it's and now I think we've got a, a lot of resources devoted to it. That Inflation Reduction Act, for example, the three hundred seventy billion dollar clean energy bill that got passed in August. They have a an incentive uh, for energy communities. So if you're if you're in an energy community that's been disproportionately impacted by fossil fuel transition, like like a coal mine closed down or a coal plant closed down, or you have a generally higher unemployment rate, or it's a former brownfield site. Um, there's a 10% incentive um, on your tax on your, your tax credits and tax incentives to invest in energy communities communities. And if you look at a map of West Virginia right now and resources for the future, RFF and Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, they've created a, a map of energy communities around the country. Pretty much the entire state of West Virginia qualifies as an energy community. Mm. And that's a big deal in terms of additional tax incentives. Another thing in the Inflation Reduction Act is uh, in order to take full advantage of the tax credits, you have to pay a prevailing wage. And so that addresses the issue of these jobs need to be, be well-paying jobs. There's another requirement on apprenticeships that a certain percentage of that of your workforce has to be in an apprentice program. So you're dealing with that transition issues, the retraining of 
fossil fuel workers. And so in order to take full advantage of the tax credits, you have to have meet those requirements in terms of prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs. Those are really good programs for West Virginia to adjust, address those just transition issues. And also the Biden administration, some of the, um, it still carries the moniker Build Back Better, but there's some, some pretty um, generous grants programs that are available targeted at coal communities, targeted at energy communities. And so there's a recognition that we need to do a lot um, in terms of retraining fossil fuel workers for these clean energy jobs, not to not leave anybody behind. Awesome. I know you've talked about the inflation redu reduction, at, like the tax credit also comes under that. But like, can you just like for someone that doesn't know what the inflation reduction act is, can you just explain the overview of that act, right? Yeah, it's probably the biggest um, piece of legislation addressed to climate change that we've ever passed. It's sort of morphed from, you know, the Build Back Better started off as six and a half or seven, six billion, six trillion dollars and whittled down to three and a half, whittled down to 1.7, down to 900 billion. And once it finally, once Senator Manchin finally got done chopping it down, we ended up about $370 billion. But it, it provides, um, continues the the incentives for renewables and then in a couple of years basically we we have the tax incentives for renewables and along with renewables we also have hydrogen um, and nuclear and carbon capture and sequestration basically treating all these potentially zero carbon resources put them on equal footing and so it's not just renewables but it's also going to be looking at so you know carbon capture and sequestration in those for those industries where you can't necessarily substitute electricity for burning coal or natural gas to in for the heat and the industrial processes there might still be some uses for fossil fuels so we're going to have to we're going to have to focus on carbon capture sequestration to be able to decarbonize that it recognizes the nuclear because it's a, you know it's a zero carbon resource to generate electricity it provides base load generation Let's incentivize that. Hydrogen plays a role as well in terms of potentially firming up, you know, wind and solar intermittent resources. You have to have some technology to store the energy. So we're exploring hydrogen um, as, as a fuel to do that. So there's just a lot of measures and lots of energy efficiency. West Virginia has a pretty poor track record on energy efficiency. You know, the utilities providing energy efficiency programs to help consumers manage their energy costs. Lots of uh, assistance in there, lots of grants in the Inflation Reduction Act for energy efficiency. And also in the transportation sector, in both that bill and the infrastructure bill that got passed last November, lots of incentives for electric vehicles, charging stations, because right now the transportation sector is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions. So we've moved beyond, used to be generating electricity, but now with the decarbonization, with coal plants closing down, it's now the transportation sector. So we really have to take aim on that. And the way you do that is electrifying the transportation system with uh, electric vehicles. And so lots of tax incentives and incentives for the infrastructure with charging stations to, to allow that to happen. And additional monies for the trans transmission grid because once you electrify the transportation system and once you encourage homeowners to stop using natural gas for space and water heating and use electric heat pumps instead, you're putting a lot more electrical loads on the grid. And frankly, the grid can't handle that. So there's billions of dollars in there for grid modernization to basically move more electricity over longer distances around the country because that's what we're going to need in order to fully decarbonize the, the electric grid. Yeah, great. Right now, incentives are really, really important in a, to push like the renewable energy agenda, the clean energy. Because like over the summer, you mentioned EDF. I was actually an EDF Climate Corps member over the summer where I worked, like I consulted for a company. Oh, and like, yeah. Yeah. In that um, experience, I realized that like if there are no incentives like in the state for like energy efficiency, um, the I am managers like the management up are not really interested in doing anything but if they see incentives then yeah. um yeah it's not not all companies are like so climate conscious we want to save the environment but when it does right. good when right. there's like an incentive when there's a tax credit then they're ready so i i really am like i'm the believer of yeah i believe in climate change yeah that i'm passionate about it so that's what i'm researching or whatever but i really believe we need to push the economics to make like it will no longer even be like oh is climate change real or not real it will be it's better for my business it saves me more money and that way we can actually help push the 
uh, agenda properly. So yeah, I really feel this Inflation Reduction Act will really help facilitate the uh, renewable energy transition. Um, you, probably so saw, you probably saw on that job that it's fairly uneven across the states. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some states like Massachusetts, New York, California, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, kind of the usual suspects, as we would say, in terms of blue progressive states that very ag aggressive mm -hmm. um, incentives in terms of energy efficiency, renewables, decarbonization. And then you got a lot of states and West Virginia is certainly in there that just really have no policies whatsoever mm -hmm. at the state yeah. level. Sure. Um, we, we just, you know, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, the AACEEE, they do the state scorecard in terms of how much do you promote energy efficiency in your state? Well, West Virginia comes in 48th. Because wow. our utilities have no energy efficiency programs. Yeah, that's that's so bad. <laughs> we, even though our residential bills right now are our uh, rates are the 18th lowest, there are 35 other states that have lower bills because we have drafty houses that haven't been insulated, and so we have relatively low rates but relatively high bills because. Our utilities don't offer energy efficiency programs compared to most other states. Mm -hmm. Then the rebates for putting more insulation in, getting energy efficient appliances, getting high efficiency heat pump and uh, high efficiency. It's in and um, just your thermal, your whole the thermal structure of your of your building. We just don't we don't have that. So it's you know and so you have if high bills and then your rate electricity rates keep going up um, and it's you know energy efficiency is the cheapest way to go in terms of of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also improving the quality of life for people. This is your house is more comfortable to live in if there's, mm -hmm. if it's properly insulated. We have, we have nothing. And there's so many states that are, I think the number one state in the ACEEE rankings this year is kind of rotates among Massachusetts and New York and California, Oregon and Washington, but really aggressive energy efficiency programs. And it makes a huge difference. So can you tell us more about your book, The Coal Trap? Like I mentioned before, it's um, kind of the working title was The Lost Decade as it focuses on that 10 years between 2009 and 2019, you know, I got to the state in West Virginia in 2011, and just the just the failure of political leaders to recognize and help manage the state through this inevitable energy transition. I mean, once we started fracking, you know, the hydraulic fracturing and the horizontal drilling, once that started getting scaled up in a big way, which happened around 2009. That was a game changer for the coal industry. Coal plants were out of the money in terms of our competitive wholesale market. It just cost more to generate with coal than with natural gas. And it was never, it was never gonna change. It was, it was never gonna um, go back in terms of, of how those numbers looked for coal. And then later on in that decade, we had energy efficiency. Wind and solar became cheaper and lots of utilities were finding it was cheaper to build new wind and solar than to continue running existing coal plants. And so the fundamental transformation in the energy industry occurred during that 10 year period. And in West Virginia, for the first part of that decade, we blamed it all on Obama's job killing EPA. It was a president who decided to go after greenhouse gases. EPA was the problem. The argument was that that's what was killing the coal industry. It was environmental regulations. And it turned out, you know, the, the chief cause of the demise of the coal industry was cheap natural gas. And later on in the decade, cheap renewables and the EPA very, had very little to do with it, but it allowed our politicians to totally abdicate their responsibility to manage the state through an energy transition and just, let's just blame it all on Washington, DC. So we lost that 10 years. I think we're finally starting to have those discussions now. We're finally starting to take advantage of transition programs. But for most of that 10 year period, you couldn't really get any traction talking about a transition because we had our political leaders misleading the, the public and saying, oh, the coal jobs aren't, aren't going away. They're coming back. Or Donald Trump says the coal jobs are coming back. Our governor was reelected on a platform in 2020 of Jim Justice. He never gave up on coal. I mean, so you had our political leaders talking about everything's fine in the coal industry if the EPA would just leave us alone. And so, so it's just a lot of the, and it's, it's just the failure of other institutions in West Virginia to really protect protect the citizens, um, like the Public Service Commission not requiring utilities to look at other resources to hold electricity prices down. You have the Department of Environmental Protection, who's charged with administering the Surface Mining Reclamation and Control Act, and turn, in other words, making sure that there's enough money to clean up after these coal mines once they've ceased operation. But if you don't get enough money, then we're going to be left with hundreds of acres of unreclaimed mine land, which is what we have in West Virginia right now, because our environmental 
regulators did not do the job to make sure that there were the resources to clean up the mess that the coal mines created. And that's just another example of just a failure of the of the state. To, you know, they put the coal industry ahead of the of the of the citizens of West Virginia. Frankly, almost at every every step of the way. And so we're we're not a, not well positioned to take advantage of the clean energy economy in terms of still this heavy dependence on on coal. Our electricity prices are growing very rapidly. The job creators who want access to renewable energy because they have corporate sustainability goals, they're reluctant to come to West Virginia because we have expensive electricity now and and 91% coal-fired electricity. So your job creators aren't going to be expanding or relocating facilities in, in West Virginia um, because we're not we don't have what they need. That's what I spent a lot of time in the book. And of course, the final chapter is just recommendations going forward. What can we do to position the state better um, going going forward to take advantage of the, the opportunities that there are there in the clean energy economy? So from what you just said, what I can get is like the book really educates people on the current status of the energy industry in West Virginia and actually recommends and gives recommendation of how you can move further. So yes. what's your vision for it, like the book? Like what, if someone picks it up, what do you really hope they take and act on? Well, the the big takeaway is political leadership that, that acknowledges we have a transition that's inevitable and it's occurring whether we, whether we agree with it or not. It's a lot of public policy measures like adopting a clean energy standard um, to encourage decarbonization, to adopt an energy efficiency portfolio standard, to basically encourage scaling up of energy efficiency programs. The job retraining is a huge thing, the, the just transition, the need to retrain fossil fuel workers. And there's a lot of steps that can be can be taken, but um, and I I cite a couple of examples of of like city of Pittsburgh, for example, in the 1990s, um, their civic leaders stepped up and realized the future is not in coal and steel, and they and they just charted a different future for the city, and they did some, some amazing work in positioning Pittsburgh going forward. It's now just it's a great city with lots of opportunities and high tech and healthcare and education. And they've transformed themselves. But it took the leaders in 1990s to step up and say, coal and steel are over. We need to figure out a different future. And in eastern Kentucky, um, Steve Bashir, who was a, Republic, a Democratic governor, and then Hal Rogers was a Republican congressman, chair of the Appropriations Committee. In 2012, they started this um, organization shaping our Appalachian region, SOAR. And they pretty much said in eastern Kentucky, the coal fields are not going to be the future. We have to figure out a different path. And you had political leaders that stepped up and did that. And that's what we're missing in West Virginia. We're finally starting to see it. I think now um, Senator Manchin and Senator Capito um, are starting to bring home those federal programs to West Virginia that will really help. But that's why I fell back on the lost decade was this should have been done this should have been done 10 years ago because the, the writing was on the wall. It was very clear in 2009 that the future of the coal industry was was a dismal one. They told the people what they thought they, they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear and just completely abandoned their responsibility to manage the state through the transition. Yeah. So um, how can we assess your book if we, if we want it? It's available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes & Noble. Any independent bookstore will probably be able to get it for you. Um, it's like I say, it's Cambridge University Press. It just came out in July of 2021, 2022, sorry, just sure. a few months ago. Oh, awesome. Um, thank you, Professor James. Um, it was really nice having you on here and like discussing this um, clean energy revolution. My audience thanks you too, because I know they've gained a lot. I'll be leaving all of his details down in the description, okay. link to the books and um your LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave your link if you, in case they need to contact you. So yeah, that will be okay. the end. And I'll see you guys in my next episode. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Sustainability Nuggets podcast. I am Rarsu Maribi. And I am Tosin Falaran Shop. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a rating and review on wherever you listen to your podcast. You can also show your support by signing up for a small donation to help sustain future episodes. You can find all relevant links in the description. See you in our next episode.